I'm dreaming of a COVID Christmas. This is part one. The title of today's message is God's Christmas Solution to Social Distancing. We're going to keep our series in Galatians on pause because today is the first Sunday of Advent season. So I want to spend the next four Lord's Days focusing on Advent, talking about Advent and Christmas and keeping that theme going. The church calendar is one of the gifts given to us by the church, Mother Church. Like the seasons of the year in nature, the seasons of the church calendar and the national calendar come full circle. And we should expect this since Paul said uh, what Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. He said, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Whoops. What is that doing? Good thing I didn't wait for my alarm to wake me up. <laughs> okay, where was I? I was still reading Colossians, right? Yeah. And, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. We want Jesus to be preeminent in everything. In everything. And the church calendar actually helps us do that. So in the weeks ahead, we will be drawing our attention to the true message of Advent, uh, of Christmas, and Epiphany. These are central events in the life of Christ and are deeply meaningful for all of human history. God became a man. He came to rescue his people. He came because God so loved the world. This is worthy of all our celebratory efforts. Just want to talk a little bit about Advent. Advent is that period of great anticipatory joy. It's a time of preparation for the celebration of the arrival of Jesus in Bethlehem as a helpless infant. In the Western liturgy, Advent begins four, day, four Sundays before December 25th, the Sunday closest to November 30th. The annual commemoration of the birth of Jesus begins the Christmas cycle of the liturgical year, a cycle that runs from Christmas Eve to the Sunday after the Feast of Epiphany. So as we celebrate Christmas, few of us think of Christmas Day as the beginning. Uh, for most families, Christmas is the culmination of weeks of planning, shopping, anticipation, decoration, all that stuff. Some don't realize that Christmas is just the first day, the first day of the 12 days of Christmas, ever since the Council of Tours met in 567 and proclaimed the 12 days from Christmas to Epiphany as a sacred and festive time. The church officially has observed both an Advent season in preparation for and a Christmas season for the celebration of our Lord's Nativity. The church year dramatizes you could say it dramatizes the biblical story of what christ has done for the salvation of his people it, it forms an annual curriculum the church calendar becomes an annual curriculum that tells the story of our faith and those who understand it understand the basics of the gospel the christian calendar is a great way for families to focus their worship and tradition Repeated traditions within biblical boundaries help all of us know and remember who we are, developing our identity as God's covenant people. And, and celebration of the themes and seasons of the life and work of, of Christ helps us express that faith. Now, we just celebrated Thanksgiving, which actually Troy called me this week, and I, and, uh, I didn't realize this was the first Sunday of Advent, and he told me, and I said, oh, I better rethink what I'm going to preach. <laughs> and, uh, but it just seems like we just had Thanksgiving. What? It's Advent already? But I think that's, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, we just celebrated Thanksgiving, which is not on the church calendar because it's a national holiday specific to America. 
But I think it's very appropriate that Advent season begins right after Thanksgiving because what do we have to be more thankful for than God sending us the greatest gift, Jesus himself, Jesus in the flesh. Steve was telling me that at the beginning today before we started. He says, I think it's appropriate that we have Thanksgiving, uh, you know, right before Christmas season. And I said, have you been looking at my notes? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's safe to say that 2020 has been a crazy year. Can we all just agree on that again? It's been a crazy year. We talked about that last week, how we shouldn't blame it on the year 2020 as in, in a superstitious kind of way. God is still sovereign still on the throne, and everything that happened this year was predestined. It was predetermined before Adam and Eve were ever here, before the world was here, before the foundations of the world were here. But that doesn't erase the fact that this has been a crazy year. I, I believe most of the craziness is a result of politically crazed hacks, but God sits in the heavens and laughs. He, he laughs at the political puny plans. Again, everything is going according to God's plan, and he never has a plan B. We've made a worldwide, we've had a worldwide pandemic, or what some might call a scamdemic, under the philosophy of never let a good crisis go to waste. We now have power drunk governors making all kinds of stupid mandates, not at all based on science, which shouldn't surprise us. Uh, do we really think the political party that supports murdering babies and the party that doesn't even know that there's two genders, I mean, basic <laughs> science, do we really think they follow the science? Churches have been shut down and pushed around this year and very few have fought back or even pushed back. And out of all this craziness, we've been better acquainted with a few more words and phrases. We have these new phrases and new words that, were, that we weren't saying a year ago, and now it's become common. These are words and phrases that have become popular because of everything that's been happening this year. In fact, I looked it up, Cambridge Dictionary's word of the year this year is quarantine. That's their word of the year, quarantine, which is ironic because we've done quarantine it, never like this before in the history of mankind. No, we're not quarantining in the traditional sense of the word. So not only is it their word of the year, it's the word they've mangled and changed to, to, to whereas to include uh, shutting down even the healthy, not just the sick. One of the new phrases is social distancing. This is a phrase that most of us have never used or heard of before 2020. I don't think so. I don't think that was ever a phrase, social distancing. So it's a new one. But now it's very familiar to us, all of us. And we've all used it. We all, we've all heard it. We've made fun of it. We've made memes, seen memes about it. For instance, there's, uh, there was a social distancing baptism memes. I don't know if you've seen those. But for the Baptistic Christians, there's a picture of a, a dunk tank, you know, like at the old fairgrounds and that kind of thing, <laughs> where the pastor could throw the ball and baptize uh, at a social distance. And then there's another one for the Presbyterian Christians, and there's a picture of a pastor with a super soaker, you know, squirt gun, <clears throat> and he squirts from a social distance to baptize his parishioners. Sometimes you just have to laugh at it all, like God does, right, from his throne. So I want to use these new words and phrases and apply them to Advent, okay? Shall we have a little fun with it? We're going to apply these words and phrases in the weeks ahead to Advent season. What we are going to see is that God gave a solution during the first Advent to all these so-called new problems that we're dealing with. There's nothing new under the sun, and God already gave the solution to all these problems that we're trying to solve in different ways. So here's the outline of where we're going to go in the next four weeks, God willing. It's, the series is called I'm Dreaming of a COVID Christmas, and today's message is God's Christmas Solution to Social Distancing. 
Next week is God's Christmas solution to lockdowns. And the next week will be God's Christmas solution to masking up. And the final message is God's Christmas version of the new normal and super spreader event. So today, as we are dreaming of a COVID Christmas, we are going to look at God's Christmas solution to social distancing. One of the things we remember in this Advent season is that there, is, there was once upon a time when we were all lost and distanced from the triune God because of our sin and our fallenness. Jesus came to Bethlehem to recover and restore our social distance problem between us and God. There was a tremendous distance that we could not solve. And because we were socially distanced from God, we were socially distanced from one another as well. Jesus came to resolve this problem when we were still his sinful enemies. <clears throat> Listen to how Rome, or Paul put it in Romans, Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. <clears throat> more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Paul describes the Roman, to the Romans the extreme nature of our prior social distancing from God when Christ came. He says we were still weak, we were ungodly, we were still sinners, we were under the wrath of God, and we were enemies of God. All those things. All those things we were when he came. That's social distancing on steroids. And that was our status when God sent Jesus to die for the ungodly, to die for us, to be saved by him from the wrath of God, to be reconciled to God by the death of his son, to be reconciled to God. That's reconciliation. The last verse of that text I just read concludes with these words. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now, what is that? What is reconciliation? It is, by definition, a change from a state of enmity or animosity or hostility between persons to one of friendship. It's changing from a, a state of uh, enmity to a state of friendship. So it's a way of describing a relationship that goes from being enemies to be to that of being friends. It's God's solution to our ultimate social distancing problem between us and him. Isaiah 59 verse 1 says this, Behold, Yahweh's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Our iniquities and sins made a separation, a, a social distancing and damning problem between us and our God. And Jesus came into this world as a helpless infant in order to solve that problem, in order to solve that ultimate social distance problem. One of the main reasons God sent his only begotten son into the world is because all mankind was separated and distanced from God because of sin and in desperate need of a savior to bring reconciliation. There's a name given in the Old Testament prophecy about Jesus coming in the flesh 
as the promised Messiah. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah calls him Emmanuel. We sang that today at the beginning of our service. In Isaiah chapter 7 through 12, there are a group of prophecies that are sometimes called the Book of Emmanuel. But first, we have to remember about the division that happened in Old Testament Israel. Israel was God's covenant people, and they were one nation under God, but they were divided at this time. They were divisible. <laughs> they were divided. They were one nation made up of 12 tribes. They soon divided and became two nations, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, or Israel and Judah. Israel was now the northern 10 tribes, and their capital city was Samaria. Judah was now the southern two tribes, and their capital city was Jerusalem. So they used to be one nation, 12 tribes. Then they were a divided nation. In other words, there was a lot of division when the prophecy for Emmanuel was given by Isaiah. There was a lot of division, separation, a lot of distancing. And the first 12 chapters of Isaiah are filled with Isaiah prophesying against Judah. The Emmanuel prophecies begin in chapter 7, in chapter 7, but remember what, what it says in Isaiah 6, what, it, what happened in Isaiah 6. We see Isaiah's dramatic and majestic call to ministry. Isaiah 6, 1 begins with these words, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. As many of you know, this is the chapter R.C. Sproul expounds on so uh, beautifully in his book, The Holiness of God. Isaiah sees the Lord sitting on his throne, high and lifted up, and he then sees the six-winged seraphim. With two wings he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And then the angels, the seraphim, call out to one another in heavenly worship, in awe of being in the presence of God, they cry out, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the temple thresholds shake and the whole place fills with smoke. And Isaiah, in the presence of this holiness and the glory of God, can only say one thing. He says, Woe is me. Woe is me, for I am, a, I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. The more you realize and recognize the holiness of God, the more you will realize and recognize how unholy we are. How unholy we are in our fallenness. R.C. Sproul says this in his book, the same book, Holiness of God. Holiness of God. He says, when we understand the character of God, when we, oh, I'm not going to try to do that. <laughs> Naivete. When, that's the word, one more, if I want to do R.C. Sproul, I have to say, Naivete. And that's all I can say is, I can imitate him just saying one word. So I'm not going to do it with this whole quote. He says this, when we understand the character of God, when we grasp something of his holiness, then we begin to understand the radical character of our sin and hopelessness. Helpless sinners can survive only by grace. Our strength is futile in itself. We are spiritually impotent without the assistance of a merciful God. We may dislike giving our attention to God's wrath and justice, but until we incline ourselves to these aspects of God's nature, we will never appreciate what has been wrought for us by grace. That's Sproul. So I want to draw a clear contrast between an Advent celebration and a secular Christmas celebration. One involves a fat magic man with a big white beard crying, ho, ho, ho. The other involves a prophecy about the coming Messiah as the angels were singing, holy, holy, holy. See what I did there? Then in the next chapter of Isaiah, we read this, Isaiah 7, 13. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, speaking to Judah, it is, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? 
Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now there's some critical writers nowadays that try to say that this word for virgin can mean young lady, but it always means virgin when it's used in scripture. The New Testament uses virgin when it's quoting this scripture. And he says, this is a sign. Behold, a sign. It wouldn't be a sign if there was just a young woman giving birth. He says, here's the sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? Now, we don't have to look it up in a concordance or no Hebrew, because Matthew, uh, Matthew in his gospel tells us what it means. He actually tells us what it means. So Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18, Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means Yahweh saves, Yahshua, Yahweh saves. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And now he's going to quote Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So Matthew tells us that Emmanuel means God with us. God, the Son himself, in the flesh, is with us. There is no more social distancing. He's with us. We see the same thing in the first chapter of the Gospel of John in verses 1 and also verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, the Word who was with God in the beginning and who was God, became flesh. He took on flesh. We call it the incarnation. God incarnate. God in the flesh. And John says he dwelt among us. The Greek word dwelt means to live in a tabernacle. The physical body of Jesus, beginning as an infant, was the new tabernacle wherein God dwelt with his people. We've talked about this before, but God is both transcendent he has attributes that are transcendent. They're other. They're, he's out there. He's, there's, a, there's a clear distinction between creator and creature. And so that is his, his transcendent attributes. Attributes that we do not share uh, with him. But then he's also eminent. He's not just out there somewhere. He's also eminent. He's with us. He's involved in his creation. He's intimately involved in everything that's happening in his creation. He's God with us. He's not some distant or absentee landlord. He's not absent or inaccessible. He's with us. We stand coram Deo before the presence of God. Uh, again, Sproul defines what it means to live coram Deo. He says, to live coram Deo is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, to the glory of God. To live in the presence of God is to understand that whatever we are doing and wherever we are doing it, we are acting under the gaze of God. Whatever we're doing, wherever we do it, we're acting under the gaze of God. God is omnipresent. That's sprawl. God's omnipresence 
meaning he's everywhere present, can and should give us comfort, but it should also give us a healthy fear of God. I mean, being under the gaze of God should give us a fear of God. And Ed Welch gives a great definition of the fear of the Lord. He says, the fear of the Lord is knowing that I live quorum Deo, before the face of God. That is the fear of the Lord, just knowing, aware of the fact that I'm living quorum Deo. He continues, Welch, it is knowing that the holy God sees every aspect of my life. The result is that we live knowing that we are seen. We live publicly and follow Christ in joyful and reverential obedience. That's Welch. One of the things we're reminded during Advent time is our God is very present. He's not uh, absent. He's not some deistic deity who created everything and just left us to ourselves. He's intimately involved in every detail of our lives. Jeremiah 23, verses 23 and 24 says this, Am I a God at hand, declares Yahweh, and not a God far away? Not a God far away. Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares Yahweh. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares Yahweh. He's saying, I'm God. I'm ever-present everywhere. I'm Yahweh. Can you do something in secret? Do you think you can do something outside of my gaze? I'm Yahweh. It's not Santa who sees you when you're sleeping and knows when you're awake and knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. I mean, that's just creepy. <laughs> It's our very real and omnipresent God. It wasn't Santa that came to town either. It was God who came to a town <laughs> called Bethlehem. The Son of God, the Word of God, who was God, tabernacled among us by taking upon himself human flesh. But God has always been a God who's with us. He's always been a God who is with us. In the incarnation, it just went up to a whole nother level. Uh, but he's always been an ever-present, omnipresent God who's with us. Psalm 139 is probably the best psalm uh, that describes the omnipresence of God. It says this, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. Sounds like that song again. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. We, he's saying, I can't, wrap my brain, I can't wrap my brain around this, that you, you're everywhere present. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? That's the rhetorical question. There is no place to hide. There is no place to go and sin in secret. The psalmist says, where shall I go? Where shall I go from your spirit or shall I flee from your presence? If, if I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. God has always been omnipresent, always been present, intimately involved with his creation, especially his people. But when Jesus came to Bethlehem in the flesh, God's presence was again brought to a whole new level. John 14, verse 6 Starting in verse 6 says this, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long? 
and you still do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Jesus, the second person of the triune God, Yahweh himself was there with them. And Jesus says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. During this Advent season and during this time of social distancing, we need to remind ourselves that God is with us. He's with us. Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. Just as Jesus was in the Father and the Father in him, so we are in Christ and Christ in us. Even at the end of his earthly ministry, before he ascended up into heaven to the right hand of the Father, on the throne where he began taking down enemies, before that happened, before he ascended, he promised to continue to be Emmanuel. Even though he was ascending up to the throne, he promised to remain their Emmanuel, our Emmanuel. He did so in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and then here's the final promise he leaves them with. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He promises that he will always be there, Emmanuel. He says, I'm with you to the always, to the end of the age. The answer to our doubts and our fears is that God is with us. God is with us. That's the answer. That's the solution to our fears and doubts. What we need even more than deliverance from trouble is that Jesus is our Emmanuel in the midst of trouble. What we need more than deliverance from trouble is that Jesus is our Emmanuel in the midst of trouble. Isaiah 43, 1 through 3 says, But now thus says Yahweh, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am Yahweh your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. We see a demonstration of this, of course, of this walking through the fire and not getting burned in the book of Daniel, a very well-known story. The empire of Babylon, under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar, had defeated the Assyrian Empire and had pushed the Egyptian Empire back into Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the hill at that time, at least for that moment. King Nebi destroyed Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, and he took all the gold from it. And he didn't just take the gold, though. He also took a group of young men, a group of young men, the cream of the crop men. Brought them back to Babylon to be trained in the swamp of Babylonian government. Among this group were four young men named Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, whose names he later changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He changed Daniel's name too, but I forgot to look it up. Belshazzar. Oh yeah, Belshazzar. Daniel's easier to say. <laughs> King Nebuchadnezzar had led, or he let power go to his head. Uh, he thought he was a god. He made this giant statue of gold of himself. 
and demanded that the whole country bow down to it and worship the statue. Then he said that whoever refuses to fall down and worship the statue shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Three of his government officials, men who were among the boys he brought from Jerusalem and trained to be part of his government, they respectfully declined. Uh, thanks, but no thanks. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't bend, to borrow a phrase from uh, the, the uh, Statler brothers, they wouldn't bend, they were willing to be burned. No, they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, but they were willing to be burned. They wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't burn. They wouldn't comply. They wouldn't comply. Then some dude ratted them out. Kate Brown would have been so proud of those of this guy, these guys who, who told on them. They told the king. And then it says in Daniel 3.12, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs. This is them tattling on them for not bowing. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Is this true? And now listen to how they answer him in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. It's just as simple as that. And you know the rest of the story. The king threw, threw them all into the fiery furnace, but they weren't burned. Why? Why weren't they burned? Because Emmanuel, God, was with them in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar was so mad, so angry, that he, he because of noncompliance, he was so angry that he turned the furnace up seven times hotter. It says this in verse 23, And th these three men... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose, in, rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. God didn't keep them out of the fire. He didn't keep them from being thrown into the fire. But he was with them in the fire. God doesn't always keep us from troubles and trials and tribulations and tests. But he has promised to be with us through it all. Emmanuel. God with us. In fact, often it is, it's in and through those troubles and trials when God is with us in a, in a deeper, more meaningful way. It's in those testings, those times of trials and tribulation where he's with us means some, it's, on, it's up to a whole new level. It, it's when life is good and everything seems to be going wonderfully that we tend to forget about God, right? It's in those hard times when God is with us in a closer and more intimate way than when everything is going hunky-dory. Can I say hunky-dory? Nobody says hunky-dory anymore, do they? Have you young people ever heard that phrase? Oh, okay. It's in the good times that we often fail to live Corindale. We fail to live it under the gaze and before the face of God. It's in the good times that we forget that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. 
It's in the tough times that we cry out to him. The Gestapo is at the door. <laughs> Psalm 23. Hello? <laughs> oh, okay. Call the uh, F the uh, FBI. <laughs> Call the FedEx guy back in here. <laughs> All right. Listen to the psalm that most of you probably know by heart in light of what we've been talking about. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now listen. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, what was all that green pastures and still waters talk? <laughs> Even when you're at the edge of death, in the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Notice, he doesn't remove all the enemies. He prepares a table in the presence of our enemies. We still have enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I shall dwell in his presence forever. He with me and me with he, together for eternity. In the Old Testament, we see all over the place, and in so many ways, uh, the separation, the social distance between God and man. We see it all over the Old Testament. There was only one person who was able to get really close to God, and that was the high priest when he entered the Holy of Holies in the, in the tabernacle and in the temple. And he was only able to do that once a year. It was when Jesus came to Bethlehem and tabernacled among us, and when he went to the cross, that the veil of separation, the veil of the temple was ripped open and torn. Jesus made it possible for all of us to have sanctuary access to the Father. All of us now with direct access, sanctuary access to the Father. In Christ, the vertical social distancing between us and the Father has ended. Also in Christ, the horizontal distancing between us from one another has ended. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 4.1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, not just bearing with one another, but bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let's remember this Advent season, the oneness and the unity that we've all been granted in Christ. We are his body, members of one another. Jesus came that first Advent to solve the social distancing problem we had between God and with one another. We are living in crazy times, but God is still sovereign, and God is still good, and God is still very present. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. We will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. In other words, 
really crazy times. The earth giving way and the mountains being thrown into the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Sila. That means pause. Think about it. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. What is that city of God? What is that house in the New Testament? It's the church. It's, it's the body of Christ. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. Yahweh of hosts is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come before the works of Yahweh. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. All this stuff happening in the, in the world. All this stuff happening in the world. He makes wars cease. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bows. He flicks the tanks a thousand miles. Don't worry about that. Don't fear all that. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. What? What is hell but torment and social distancing on steroids for all eternity? But to those of us who are in Christ and trust in him and trust in his finished work for us on the cross by grace alone through faith alone, we have been reconciled. We have been reconciled in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 17 through 21 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's all about reconciliation. It's all about solving the social, the ultimate social distancing problem. And the problem was not that we need to social distance. The problem was that we were social distancing. We were already distant and Jesus came to Fix that problem. Solve that problem. And I'll close by reading the words of Paul in Ephesians 2. Therefore, re remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple.
temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. He's with us. He's, he's built this dwelling place called the church. And he's still with us. And he's still a very present help in times of trouble. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Let's pray together. Lord, our God, you have given to us the glorious gospel of our risen Savior and Master. Grant that as we joyfully receive the good news for ourselves, so we may gratefully share it with others and ever give glory to you, by whose grace alone we are what we are, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen.